Amen. We've been talking about liberty as it relates to the life of a believer. This is a subject matter that I fear uh, many don't understand. I think, I think many, if not most, in the uh, fundamentalist and evangelical camps understand it poorly in one way. They're still stuck under the bondage of law. But then we have the more liberal theologians who go off in the other direction. And they basically have abandoned all responsibility to God, all sense of morality, all sense of righteousness and godliness. Uh, I know affirming churches right here in Dallas uh, that are not spirit-filled affirming churches, but they teach anything goes. You know, as long as you go to church and you kind of tilt your hat to God, you know, every Sunday, everything will be good in the end. You know, it, it, you know, God's so cool and God is so, you know, funky that you don't really have to worry. He, he understands everything you do and there's no rules, there's, there's nothing. Well, that's going too far in the other direction. That's, that's what I like to refer to as hyper-liberal. I want you to understand the concept of liberty. Last week, we began a passage, and we began going through a passage of Scripture, and we were breaking it down. But this week, I happened to think of, I thought of an, a, a, an illustration that I think would really help people to understand the concept of law versus liberty especially. Because some of our viewers last week kind of commented and said, I, wait, hold on, I don't quite get this. Well, if you don't get it, make a comment on Facebook or make a comment on YouTube. And believe me, I'll try to help you get it. I'm here to teach. I'm not up here to hear my own voice. I want you to understand it. Under the law, Israel was in covenant with God, but the system that God gave to the people of Israel was a system of law. It was rules. It was regulations. It was dogma. It was specifics, and it was demanding, and it was oppressive. It was, in effect, authoritarian. It was God saying, this is how I would have to act if I were to demand that you live holy and righteous before me. These are all the things you would have to do if you were to ever have any hope of standing before me with any semblance of righteousness or holiness. But now, here's the interesting thing. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says to us, what the law, listen to me now, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Well, wait a minute. God created the law. God designed the law. God gave the law to Moses. But it could not still accomplish its task. Do you think that God didn't know this? Do you think that God built a machine he built this, this structure. He created this system. And he had no idea. The, oh, what well, do you know? It doesn't work. Do you think God did not know it wouldn't work? No. God knew it wouldn't work from the get-go. But you see, the whole point was not to actually help the people of Israel to achieve holiness and righteousness before him. It was to help them strive for holiness and righteousness. But the law, while it did not actually succeed in its 
apparent function, it did succeed in its actual function. Now, I've got, I've got to break this down a little bit more for you. I remember when I was a kid, they started this new math. And they tried to bring this junk into our school, and they wanted us kids to learn new math. All of a sudden, instead of just multiplying 7 times 7 and coming up with 49, they wanted us to do, you know, this way, that way. You had to follow a certain path. And it seemed like the new math was so ridiculously complicated. It was so unnecessary. I can achieve the answer without going through all this process. But the problem is, what most people didn't realize, Martin, is that new math was not about achieving the answer. That was the apparent purpose of new math. But the actual purpose was to help young people to be able to follow process. It was to help them learn to approach something that may be common to them from a different perspective. Because oftentimes in life, if you grow up and you become a bookkeeper or an accountant or an architect or an engineer or a scientist you're, and you work with math, you know, you're going to come to problems that are going to require you to kind of find another avenue to come to the conclusion that you need. Now, you know what's your conclusion. You know what the answer is before you ever start. The problem is you've got to find another way to get to that answer. Do you follow what I'm saying? So new math was not intended to teach you how to multiply or how to divide. No, you already know how to multiply. You already know how to divide. New math had a whole different purpose. And that purpose was to help you to reason and to follow process. Can you be given a process and can you learn to follow that process? Even if it's tedious, even if it's boring, even if you already know the answer, can you follow process? How many people do you know in this world work at your store and you'll try to show them how to use the register and it'll take weeks when it ought to take hours. Because why? They don't know how to follow process. Right. They don't understand that, okay, this leads to the next step, and then this leads to the next step, and then once I get to that step, I'm going to have these options. You know, I've worked in retail over, over the course of my life. I've done all kinds of jobs. I've worked in retail. I've worked in department stores. I know how all kind of different computer systems work. Of course, the ones that I operated had a little hamster on the inside running on the wheel, but I know how all kinds of systems work. You know, I can follow a process. Back in my day, if you worked at Sears or you worked at Montgomery Ward, I worked at Montgomery Ward in 1982. Yes, in 1982, I was old enough to work. I worked for Montgomery Ward. We used to have to punch in. First of all, we had to put our employee number in just to get the computer to open up. By hand. Yep, you punched in your, your number. Then you had to punch in the quantity of items. One, enter. Then you had to enter the item department number on the ticket. We had a department number. Department 749, 749, enter. Then you entered the item number. You enter the item number. Enter. Then you enter the price and enter the because back then we they didn't, didn't, didn't do all that for you. This was helping the company to keep uh, records of what they sold and you know inventory and all that. 
But the process, you'd have to go through a process. And you had to be able to learn to follow process. All right, it's very simple. It's on the ticket in the order you need to go. First, you start with your employee number, though. Then you go to quantity. Then you go department number, item number, price. You follow? Yeah. You go through all that. Then you're going to hit subtotal. That's going to tell you what it comes to uh, with tax and the whole nine yards and give the person the opportunity to pay. All right. So new math was not designed to actually help you do the math. That was the apparent. That, that's what it looked like it was meant to do. You follow. But its true purpose was to help you learn process. All right. The law of Moses looked like it was designed to create a holy people. A sanctified, consecrated people unto God. But the word of God said, all of our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. All of it. If you follow every single item of the law, you still stand before God a filthy little beggar. Not because you're so bad. See, this is where the church has, has loved to, to, you know, we just love to... Uh, make human beings feel as bad about themselves as we possibly can. You're so sinful, glory to God. You're so wicked that all your righteousness means nothing to God. It's because you're so sinful. No, it is not. It's because He's so holy. See, you've got to understand, you, you can't, the Word of God said, you cannot even physically stand in the presence of God as a human being, because you'll die. Your physical body will die. There have been times when God has carried men up and he's allowed them a glimpse of himself and the Bible said they literally fall on the ground as if they were dead. Because it's too much for them to take in. I've been in camp meeting services. In the Church of God, right here in, in Weathers, uh, Weatherford, Texas. And I remember one service in particular. I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I don't know how to really put it into words. But the holiness of God, and I'm getting chills just remembering it. The holiness of God descended on that tabernacle. And Martin there was the most awesome hush that fell across this crowd. And I mean, there were a thousand some odd people. There were a lot of people there. And this awesome hush came over every soul in the building. And we all stood there. And suddenly, I can't explain it, you felt this revelation of God's holiness. You felt like God's purity, His perfection, His sinlessness, His justice, His equity. Everything about Him is pure and perfect. When do you ever feel that kind of an environment? You don't, because in this world there's there's trouble everywhere you turn. There's something going wrong. Sin is involved in every corner, everywhere. You can't even go into a business and be done right anymore. Everybody's trying to reach in your pocket and get a few extra dollars out of you. But all of a sudden, we're standing in the presence of God and this, this holy anointing came down. And all we could do, everybody in that tabernacle, all we could do was weep and cry and wail in the presence of God. That's all we could do. There was no shouting. There was no dancing. There was no running the aisles. But it was one of the most powerful and profound experiences I have ever had. It was as if God was saying, let me show you what my holiness feels like. 
And then you tell me, with all your long hair and your long sleeves and your long dresses, if you feel like this every day. Ooh, boy, were we missing the mark. Were we miles off. Do you follow what I'm saying? So when the Word of God said all our righteousness is before the Lord is filthy rags, it's not because you're so filthy. It's because God is so holy. His holiness is astounding. And holiness, I try to help people understand. Holiness, H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S, the best way I can define holiness to you is this. Holiness. W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Holiness is to be whole and complete in everything that is good and pure and righteous and true. Not most of the way there in this area while lacking a little bit in this area. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, 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 no. It's being completely, totally, 100% right and just and pure and love all the things the Word of God describes God as being. The Bible said, for instance, God is love. It does not say God simply loves. God is love. One of the aspects of holiness is to be holy entirely completely, 100% love. What one of us, with our high hair and long sleeves, what one of us qualifies in that regard? You love everybody, you don't have no problem dealing with anybody because you love them and all you can feel for them is love. You don't feel judgment. You don't feel criticism because all you feel is love. I'm going to tell you, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm not kidding. You feel all these things. You feel, uh, you get in touch with God in a way you've never been in touch with God. You're going to love things you never thought you could love. You're going to love the bricks that make up the building. You're going to love the street light out on the road. You're going to love the lamp post. You're going to love uh, the telephone post. I'm telling you, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you feel and you sense God in His fullness. And you feel a peace and you feel a joy and you feel the love of God. All these things. God is all of these things. He doesn't possess these qualities. He is these things. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, the Old Testament law was an authoritarian approach to holiness, to trying to help you not achieve, but rather to strive toward. That's why in the New Testament in Hebrews, the Word of God said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Uh, Paul didn't say, be at peace with all men and possess holiness. No, he said, follow peace with all men. Pursue it. Strive for it. He said, with all men and holiness. So what's he saying? He's saying these two things, peace with all men, now, how likely are you to be able to achieve that? Not very likely, because there's always going to be people that no matter how hard you try, they're not going to let you be at peace with them. But you follow it. You strive for it. You pursue it. And then Paul tacks on, and holiness. So he is saying, both of these things are basically unattainable in this life. You cannot get them, but you can pursue them. And without pursuing holiness, no man can see God. If you're not in pursuit of holiness, so the Old Testament law was in fact not a means to an end, but it was the means to help man pursue holiness. Do you follow what I'm saying? But the apparent 
purpose of the law and the actual purpose of the law were two different things. What was the actual purpose of the law? Paul told us in the New Testament. Now, Paul was one of the, uh, the most educated men in the Jewish faith that ever, ever converted to Christianity. He was a Pharisee. He had been trained to become a Pharisee under one of the greatest Jewish minds of all time. His, te his teacher was one of the greatest teachers in all of Judaism at his time. Paul had had a phenomenal education in the Jewish faith. So one of the wonderful things when God specifically handpicked Paul to be the uh, apostle to the Gentiles, he picked the cream of the crop. He literally picked the best of the best. He needed somebody who could help build a bridge between the Jewish faith and this new Christian faith because the two are married. You know, Christianity is born out of Judaism. Without Judaism, there is no Christianity. Without the law, there is no cross. We had to have the law to have the cross. So Paul helped us to understand that, number one, the law could not accomplish it's apparent task. But it did accomplish its actual task. What was its actual task? Paul said, the law was our school teacher. He said, the law was our school teacher. It taught us something. The law taught us something. What did the law teach us? In a nutshell, if you really want to break it down to the absolute barest, most minimal explanation of what the law taught us, it taught us we needed a Savior. Lord, I can't do it. I can't do it. I cannot keep all of the hundreds and hundreds of rules and all of the hundreds and hundreds of laws within the confines of the Hebrew law, of, of the Mosaic law. I can't do it, Lord. I can't do it. But God had already promised a Savior, hadn't He? Well, the law taught us you really need that guy. You really need that Savior that God has promised. You really, really need him bad. So the Jewish people should have been craving the arrival of Messiah. But you know what happened instead? You had people instead who became so obsessed with the apparent purpose of the law. They became so obsessed with rule keeping and keeping, uh, uh, you know, all these laws. They became so obsessed with that that they didn't learn the lesson that the school teacher was trying to teach them. Now, let me give you a little clearer an example to bring this into focus concerning liberty. The law was an authoritarian approach. You're going to look anything like me. If I were to walk on planet Earth, this is how I would walk. I wouldn't even wear, I wouldn't even wear mixed clothing. I wouldn't even wear clothing that was partly made of polyester and partly made of cotton. I would wear clothing that was, my outfit from top to bottom would be made from one fabric. Why? Because I am God and I like everything to be perfect. I like everything to be unified. I like everything to be specifically one way. Why would I wear polyester on top and cotton on the bottom? No, I would wear an outfit. You, do you follow what I'm saying? God's trying to help them understand. Okay, now, if you don't do this, if you don't follow these rules, there's punishment. 
to be meted out. There, there are repercussions. There are things you have to do in order to purify yourself so that you once again can enter the temple. You once again can be in the company of your husband. You once again can enter your home even. Many of these laws. It was an authoritarian approach. It was a harsh approach. It wasn't easy. Many people say, well, you know, bless God, the Bible's a bunch of bunk because look at God. I mean, boy, in the Old Testament, he just mean and he's rotten and he... Yeah, to some degree, you're right. To some degree, you're right. You're really right. You know why? Because God down here picked out one specific nation of people that he would demonstrate himself to the world through and he appeared to be a taskmaster of sorts. He appeared to be as it were an abusive husband. You're going to do this or else. I told you to make dinner. I told you when I get home I expect dinner on the table at 5 o'clock and not one minute after 5. That's what it looked like. That's what it appeared like. All these rules were so rigid and so strict. Yeah, it made God look like an abusive husband. No doubt. But what was God trying to do over here? He's trying to make us ready for the arrival of Jesus. He's trying to teach us something. Now picture, if you will, a woman who's married to a miserable, abusive, nasty man. She's married to him for 20 years, and by God, she does a lot of things for him, but she does them out of fear. She does them because she is commanded to do them. It's, it's demanded of her that she do these things. She really has no option, because if she don't do it, she may very well get beaten or hurt. Imagine that woman, and then all of a sudden her husband dies. And along comes her prince in shining armor on a white horse. He is the most loving, the most generous, the most kind. The most compassionate man she's ever met in her life. They get married. She does many of the same things for him that she did for her first husband. The only difference is she does them for very different reasons. This guy over here demanded that dinner be on the table, bless God, and if she, if it wasn't, he might backhand her. This guy over here says, honey, you can put dinner on the table whenever you want to, whenever you're able to, and if you don't feel like cooking, we'll go out and eat. Doesn't matter to me, no way. Don't worry about it. It's not a big thing. But you know what she does? She puts dinner on the table 5 o'clock every day. Because she learned to do that under this guy. She got into the habit of doing certain things certain ways under this guy. And now she's so in love and so enamored with this man that she does these things out of love. She does these things out of devotion. She does these things out of respect. Do you follow what I'm saying? She's doing a lot of the same thing. She's still putting dinner on the table at a certain hour. She's still making the bed a certain way. She's still dressing, you know, uh, uh, every time she goes out of the house, she tries to look nice. And her husband said, honey, you don't have to. I remember when I was a kid, I hope mom isn't watching, but I remember when I was a kid, my mother, boy, I mean to tell you, she wouldn't leave the house. Her phrase was, without putting my face on, you know. Nowadays, you, you young girls don't know what that is, but uh, my mother used to always say, I'm not leaving the house, I'm putting my face on. So we'd have to sit and wait for her to pretty up and prip up. And my mother was a looker, I'll tell you what. 
She was, my mom was awful pretty in her younger days. And she's not ugly now, but I'm saying, you know, when she was younger, I'm telling you, I, I used to get ticked off because some of them fellas were a little aggressive in their eyeballing her, you know. She could tell you how aggravated I used to get sometimes. Some of the men that would want to flirt with her and stuff, we'd be in the store trying to buy something, and the salesman, oh, he'd just be flirting with her. Up to, I wanted to kick him right where the sun didn't shine. But my mother would say, I'm not leaving the house on my face on. Well, now, maybe that woman, when she was married to the abusive husband, she put her face on before she left the house, because if she didn't, he, there'd be repercussions. Now she's married to this guy. He don't care if she leaves the house looking plain Jane with curlers in her hair and a kerchief tied around her head. Now, you younger kids, you don't know what I'm talking about, but us older folks, you know what I'm talking about. He don't care. Doesn't that? He loves her regardless. He's proud of her because of who she is, not just what she looks like. Do you follow what I'm saying? That is law versus grace. But you don't appreciate grace until you have experienced the law. So in order to help the world to see and understand the arrival of God Almighty in human form. For God so loved the world. The Bible teaches us that the whole concept of marriage and divorce is to help us understand the transition between the law and grace. The law and liberty. Oh, we get so carried away, bless God, to marriage and divorce. My God, marriage is a sacred institution. But my, no, marriage, my friend, is an earthly estate. There is no marriage in heaven. There is no marriage after the resurrection. Jesus himself told us that. It is not some divine estate. There would be no need of marriage if we were not living a human existence in human bodies having human needs. There'd be no need of marriage. But marriage illustrates for us the relationship between law and grace, law and liberty. How does it do that? Because the Apostle Paul said, you cannot be married to the law and simultaneously be married to Christ. Said you can't do it. Said also the law, you cannot divorce the law and marry Christ. The only way this thing works is the way that God established marriage and divorce to work. And that is you are married until your spouse dies. So God said, the only way you can be married to Christ, the law has to die. It's got to be dead to you. Are you following me? That old abuse, oh, that old abusive God that you grew up with in church, that old abusive God that you were taught about in church, that old God that used to beat you because that's the way it appeared in the law. You don't divorce him to become a Christian, to become a child of God. No! Jesus killed the law! The law is dead! You've got to move on with your life. Hallelujah! Oh, I don't know about you, but this is good. Where I'm Up here, it's feeling good. A lot of people, Martin, try... To stay married to this guy, the abusive one, and at the same time they try to play hooky with Jesus. Doesn't work. That's why we got a church today full of a bunch of spiritual idiots. Because they are trying to be married to the law. They're trying to be married to the God that is represented in the law. Rather than simply learn the lessons the law was meant to teach you. And then graduate. Because Paul said, 
as the child of God, he said, we have no longer any need of a teacher. He said, now the need for a teacher has passed. No, I don't, need, I don't need to learn anymore. I've learned what I need to learn. I need a Savior. I need Jesus. I couldn't make heaven on my own if I wanted to. It doesn't matter no matter how hard I try. There is no way on earth I could ever be perfect. There is no way on earth. Let me tell you, you could be straight tomorrow. Some of y'all. And I've got news for you. That preacher going to get up in the pulpit. And he's going to have a list of another hundred things that you're failing in. He's going to let you know, brother, that you're still headed for hell and you're still hell bound and you're still condemned by God because you still have this thought or because you still do this or because you still say that or because you go here or you go there. There's, there's never, ever going to be an end to, to the requirements. They're exhausted. They just keep going on and on. And on am I telling the truth? How many of us in this room know what I'm talking about? Amen. This is why you need to get through your head, LGBT person. You, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be a child of God and be who you are and don't let the devil tell you any different because it doesn't matter. You cannot be perfect by any standard. By any standard. It's impossible. The, the apostle told us in the New Testament. It is impossible. He said. For all have sinned. And come short. Of the glory. Of God. He's talking about believers. Not unbelievers. Because unbelievers are not trying. To live up to the glory of God. Am I telling the truth? No, only believers are. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then if you go to John's epistle, the apostle John says, if we say, you remember what I've told you before about the epistles? When he speaks inclusively, we, us, he's talking about the church. When the, when the writers, Paul, John, Peter, James, whoever it may be, when he speaks of them, or those, he's talking about those outside of the church. So John says in his epistle, if we say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. Well, who has the truth in them to begin with? Unbelievers? No, believers. Believers. Paul said, uh, Paul, John said, believer, let me help you understand. If we say, Martin, Tommy, Lisa, Johnny, Bill, Donna, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not within us. That's right. That's the truth is not within us. Amen. And we make God a liar. Woo! Holy mackerel. Not only is the truth not in us, but we're making, we're trying to accuse God of telling a fib. We're trying to accuse God of being a liar. So you see, when you become born again, the purpose is not for you to become perfect. The purpose is for you to get on the path and begin your journey toward perfection. You strive to live a godly life. You strive to live a holy life. You do things for your love because you love them, not because he demands that you do them. The closer, this is why I said the purpose and function of our church is different than many, many churches. I'm not, I don't get up here and preach, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, don't you dare do this, you're going to hell. Oh, don't you know? That's not how this preacher preaches. I'm too busy trying to help you because the whole focus of the gospel is relationship with God. So my job is my only job is to help you establish and maintain your relationship with God. 
My job is to help you understand him better, know him better. I'm going to tell you a little secret. We used to sing a song in the Church of God years ago. I love this old song. One of these days we'll have to dig it out of an old songbook and sing it. <laughs> this old song said, The more I know him, the more I love him. He takes my heartache and my burden, and he gives my face a glow. And with each new day, God finds a new way to make me happy. That's why I love him so. The Word of God said we love him. Why? Because he demands we love him? No. Because he first loved us. We respond to his first move. How many of us in this room that have ever been in a relationship or in a relationship now can remember to this day when our great love interest, somebody we really, really fell for, and you met? Which one of you made the first move? Do you remember? I ain't talking to you over there. I know who made the first move that day. You remember who made the first move? There's something about that first move in there. The person who makes the first move doesn't just have an interest but they somehow or another find the nerve to overcome any obstacle so that they can make their interests known. We love Him because He first loved us. God made the first move. He made the first move. How did He move? He became a man. He manifested Himself in this world. He began to reveal Himself not as being the authoritarian God of the Old Testament. No, no, no. All of a sudden we're starting to see. What are we seeing in the New Testament? Are we seeing God putting on a different act? No. We're showing God revealing His true self. Oh my goodness. Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You will never know who the Father is unless you come to me first. You'll never understand who the Father is. Why? Because I am the way, the truth, the truth, the truth. I am the true face of God. That authoritarian face of God was only there for what real purpose? To teach us a lesson. Are you following me tonight now? That authoritarian was only there to teach us. Jesus comes and says, okay, now I am the truth. I am the true face of God. This is what your God really looks like. Now, how easy should it be for people to fall in love with our God when they look at Jesus? How easy should it be? Should be easy as pie, shouldn't it? Problem is, we got preachers in the New Testament world who are preaching an Old Testament God. Yeah. You hear what I said? We got preachers in the, I didn't say in the New Testament church. Notice, I didn't say in the New Testament church. Why did I not say that? Because truthfully, they're not in the church. They're not. They think they are. They think they're part of the church of Christ. They think they're part of the church of God. They're not. Because they're still married to the law. And God said, no sir, you can't be married to two husbands. See, the interesting thing about polygamy, a husband can have more than one wife. But a wife can't have more than one husband. 
The church is the wife. Israel is described as a woman. I preached a message some years ago. I'll have to preach some, some variation of it again at some point in the future. You remember the story of Jacob? You remember how Jacob wanted this beautiful young woman that he saw to be his wife and he made arrangements with his would-be father-in-law to work for him for seven years. And then the night he went in to take his wife, he found out, oops, I got duped. He gave me the older daughter. I didn't get the one I wanted. So then he had to go and negotiate another seven years so he could get the new wife. The new wife's the wife he wanted. Honey, I got news for you. That is a type of Israel and the church. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God wanted the church. But he had to get Israel first. Oh, my goodness. The one he was in love with, the one that he was passionate about, was the younger of the two, not the older. Oh, my God. They come from the same family. We today, according to the Word of God, even as Gentiles, we are part of the spiritual house of Israel. Both Israel and the church come out of the same house. But God wanted the church. Now, there are Jews in the church. There are Jews, in, and the Jews that are in the church, they're part of the younger, the one God wanted. Do you follow what I'm saying today? So liberty in Christianity is not about running around doing whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. That's not what liberty is about. Liberty is about serving the Lord and not being under the mandates and the weights of law and edicts and demands. But it's our job as believers. I hope you're getting something out of this tonight. It's our job as believers to establish and to work on our relationship with the Lord so that the more we love Him, because how does He want us to love Him? With everything we've got, with all our might, with all our mind, with all our soul. He wants us to love Him with everything we've got. He doesn't bang us on the head and say, you must love me with everything you've got. But just get to know me. Get to know me. Honey, please, get to know me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, since Tommy... I'm going to speak for him for a minute. Since he's come into this thing, you're not going to tell me that he doesn't see a loving, benevolent, generous, giving, blessing God. Am I telling the truth? Is that what you saw growing up, Jehovah's Witness? No. It's not what I saw growing up in Assemblies of God either. I got news for you. I was told, oh, God's love, God's love, God's love. Now, bam, 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 bam. That's the God I got pointed to. Praise God. Woo, I worship a God who abuses the fire out of me. He beats the fire out of me every time I do something wrong. That's the God I, woo, hallelujah. That's what I grew up in. We have a hard time filling this church. Because if I preach the God of the Old Testament like so many so-called New Testament churches do, we'd fill it up in a flat minute. We'd fill it up, yeah, because that's what people are used to hearing. That's what people think they're supposed to hear. How many women have an abusive husband, divorce him, Run off, get married, and what do they marry? Another one. Just exactly like the first one. Why? They've gotten to the place in their life where they believe that is all they deserve. They believe that is what marriage is supposed to look like. They think this is what it's all about. This is what marriage looks like. If I'm going to have a man in my life, if I'm going to have somebody to help support me and, you know, keep me in food and wearing clothes and have a roof over my head. I just have to get used to being abused. I have to get used to being uh, torn up uh, emotionally. I have to get used to being verbally attacked and abused. Do you follow what I'm saying? I'm telling you folks, 
the whole reason this church tonight is not packed from rafter to rafter is for that very reason. Because most Christians in the church today believe that our message is insane. They think this preacher's out of his cotton picking mind. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. You can't be married to the law and be married to Christ. It's impossible. You cannot divorce the law and be married to Christ because that means the law would still be alive. But you're not free from it. According to Scripture, Paul compared the law and Christ. He compared it to divorce and remarriage. He said God doesn't allow divorce and remarriage. The only way you can leave one and marry the other, the first has to die. So therefore, the law has to die to you. Martin, my job that is so hard is trying to help people who come into this church understand the old man's dead. The law is dead. The law is dead. LGBT believer, the law is is dead. It's dead. It's dead. It's dead. It's dead. It's dead. It is buried. It is dead. Get to know Christ. Get to know the Lord. Get to know. Read about that Jesus in your Bible. And as you read about the Jesus in the Bible, the apostle told us that we see the glory of God. What did he say? All have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. But the scripture said we see the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Woo! All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not a one of us looks like Jesus. Do you follow me? Absolutely. But when, oh, how... Ooh, I'm telling you, I want to get Pentecostal so bad, I wish to God I had a, at least one or two Sister Holy High hairs up in here. Because I'm telling you, I know if they know what the Holy Ghost is at all, we'd be shouting all over this place. I made room for us to run now. Now we can run the aisles and hallelujah. You think I'm kidding? You watch. One of these Sundays, the Holy Ghost going to hit me and I'm going to run these aisles. Isn't this marvelous? In this teaching, in this, in this incredible, so I'm not talking about how wonderful Pastor Charles is. I'm, I'm talking about it. just the truth is so liberating. It is so, that's where our liberty is. Mm -hmm.